good morning professor dr yeah. arvind kumar sir good morning can you hear me yeah i can hear you good morning to all of you so just to introduce dr vahi is there from our team uh, dr monica singh dr bhavna malhotra dr gurbir kaur dr mukinda singh sir a uh, very warm good morning to all of you uh, dr arvind you, we we met you know in 2016 at uh, hotel vivanta taj vivanta you know for that function you had come personally thank you sir thank you so so nice of you so shall we start sir so just to just to reproduce sure thank you sir that's right so shall we start sir yes you should good morning everyone i dr amita arora on behalf of international homeopathic foundation welcome you all today on this day of 25th feb 2022 तो एज यू नो कि कोविड के टाइम पे जब से कोविड स्टार्ट हुआ है 2019 2020 से आई एच एफ हैज बीन ऑर्गेनाइजिंग वेरियस पैनल डिस्कशन वी हैव इनवाइटेड वेरियस स्पीकर्स ऑन दिस पैनल हु हैव शेयर्ड देयर एक्सपीरियंसेस एज वेल बिकॉज कोविड वाज न्यू फॉर एवरीवन सो टुडे ऑन दिस डे आई वेलकम डॉक्टर अरविंद कुमार सर ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ इंटरनेशनल होम्योपैथिक फाउंडेशन and uh, thank you sir ki you have taken your valuable time out for us to teach us to let us know ke what your experiences are of covid and uh, i now hand over the panel to dr monica singh vice president uh, ihf academics and scientific committee dr monica kindly take over you can unmute yourself thank you dr amita a very good morning and warm welcome to all uh, today uh, we have a very great personality with us we are very fortunate to have professor dr arvind kumar who is from uh, medanta the med city gurgaon and uh, we have been listening to him through various uh, social media platforms when covid was at its peak uh, he delivered his invaluable lectures those days and uh, uh, he is a uh, chairman um, he is renowned thoracic thoracoscopic and robotic surgeon chairman institute of chest surgery chest onco surgery and, uh, and lung transplant co chairman medanta robotic institute former he was chairman center of chest surgery and director institute of robotic surgery at sir gangaram hospital new delhi he is founder and managing trustee of lung care foundation india also dr b c roy awardi eminent medical person of the year 2014 the list is very long and i think we should start his today's topic is covid 19 the past present and future with this short introduction i hand it um, over to you sir uh thanks to all of you dr wahi dr monica dr aroda and other eminent doctors a very warm good morning to all of you uh can you stop sharing the slides yes so, yes sir yes yeah. i'll stop sharing yes sir. yeah thank you uh you'll have to enable i have done that sir you can okay. share your slide it's showing let's see yeah thank you okay. very kind of you okay so uh, the topic that i have chosen is uh, uh, covid the journey so far the first the second and the third waves that we faced and well we don't know if there are any more waves to come which way are we headed and an often discussed topic of post covid complications first of all i bring you greetings from medanta the medicity uh, and i'm grateful to all of you to international homeopathy foundation for this very kind invitation and the opportunity to share my experiences with all of you before i go further i just wish to spend a few minutes sharing that chest surgery is a very neglected field in our country 
So typically, it used to be called cardiothoracic surgery because heart and lung both are situated in the chest. So historically, in late 50s, when this surgery was developing, the heart and lung, they were clubbed together and this specialty of cardiothoracic developed. Uh, the West realized very early on in the 60s and early 70s that heart and lung are actually separate ball games, and they separated cardiac uh, stream and thoracic, that is lung, esophagus, and other streams early on. So they had uh, a cardiac stream and a thoracic stream. In our country, it continued to be clubbed as cardiothoracic. So all medical colleges across the country had cardiothoracic department with MCH in cardiothoracic surgery, but they were only doing cardiac because that was glamorous, that was more common, that would afflict uh, uh, very, you know, mobile, upwardly mobile and uh, influential people. And thoracic surgery was mostly tuberculosis, which patients were very poor in pathetic condition and infectious, people were scared. Nobody wanted to do. So thoracic was not taught in any MCH course. And since people didn't learn, then when they started practicing, they didn't do. And therefore, this vicious cycle went on and there was no thoracic activity. When I joined, I'm originally from All India Institute. I joined in 1976 as an undergraduate MBBS student. And I spent 35 years there to take voluntary retirement in 2012. So 88, when I joined as a faculty in the Department of Surgery, we used to often get requests from our chest physicians to do some diagnostic chest uh, uh, opening thoracotomies for biopsy purposes, because at that time, all the modern investigations were not there. And just to help them out, I started doing these procedures, along with my senior colleague, Professor T.K. Chattopadhyay, to whom I owe my career. And uh, over a period of two, three years, it kind of started interesting me, became a passion. And in mid nineties, I got a uh, invitation to go to Sloan Catering Cancer Hospital, spent three months there and that was a game changer and I developed huge interest. So over the next about uh, 15, 18 years, I traveled across the globe, learned this specialty, came back and applied it at the All India Institute and then I, left in 2012 to start India's first academic program in uh, chest surgery, which is called DNB in thoracic, not cardiothoracic, thoracic, which I started at Gangaram in January 2014. And what you see here is, is, is our department. So eight years we were in Gangaram and in December of 2020, I moved to Medanta Hospital along with my entire team. And today, I'm happy to share that we are the largest chest surgery department in the country with seven consultants, uh, uh, a DNB program, which is the only one of its kind in the country. Uh, we have support staff in the form of physiotherapists, dedicated nurses, and it's a total of about 20 people who moved from Gangaram. And we do entire range of chest surgery. And today, chest surgery is not just tuberculosis. It is a lot more. So we deal with lungs, the pleura, the chest wall, the trachea, the bronchus, the esophagus, the diaphragm, and thoracic inlet. So from neck, root of the neck to diaphragm, every disease, whether it is benign disease, malignant disease, or trauma, because we get a lot of trauma now, and we do by open surgery, by keyhole, that is VAT surgery, and robotic, depending on the indication. We do about 100 major chest cases a day, a, a month. So it's the largest chest surgery department in the country today. So it's been a very satisfying journey, thanks to God and to elders and greetings of friends like you. So I bring you greetings from this uh, department of chest surgery at Medanta. Uh, coming to the topic now, we all are aware that this pandemic started, at least it was announced to the world. Maybe it started much earlier, but was hidden but was announced to the world in December of 2019 from a place called Wuhan. And whether it was from the bats which were being sold in the meat house there, or it was a leak from the lab, this is a moot point. And I think it will continue to be a point of discussion for, for times to come. We leave it there. But from China, it quickly moved to the Europe. And it was mainly because a large number of Chinese workers 
who used to work in a place called Florence in Italy had come home for Chinese New Year. And when they went back, they were all greeted, welcomed with warm hug by, the, by their Italian um, friends. And that's how it got transmitted. And Italy was one of the first countries to get afflicted. And of course, it quickly spread across Europe, across USA, and across the rest of the world. We had our first case in January in Kerala, and then first mortality in March in, in Karnataka. And that was the time it started in our country. But starting from few cases, it started doubling at a very, very fast speed. And at that time, I used to be regularly appearing on NDTV and I, the, looking at the rate of doubling, we, we realized and we had seen in TV, on TV, we had heard in newspapers and on social media, the horror which uh, Europe and US were going through. And we imagined that with their kind of healthcare system, if they have a situation there that the people are dying outside their emergencies and ventilators are not available, we just imagined if that was to happen in India, we'll have mayhem. So we, we made a lot of appeals and I think it was a collective effort of everybody that uh, uh, first of its kind historic curfew, first we had a Janta curfew for a day and then the uh, nationwide lockdown was avoided, which I think was a historic, very important step, which saved the country from mayhem at that time, because nobody knew, nobody had any idea about what was happening at that time. Initially, it was announced for 21 days, and as we all know, it continued. Of course, all these images will remain etched in our memories for as long as we live. Uh, millions of laborers migrating from one part of the, to another country, people traveling along railway tracks, all these images will remain etched as part of the first wave which country faced. So there was lockdown part one, lockdown part two, lockdown part three, and then there was slow unlocking. And slowly, slowly by end of 2020, we had started recovering from it. But by that time, Europe and US had started having its second wave. And this time, the, 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 the cause, the virus had changed, mutated itself into something called. So initial world was called alpha. And then we had this time delta, which was not only more infectious, but was also causing more lung complications, higher mortality, higher ICU admissions. Of course, a historic step started in our country. <laughs> Sorry, excuse me. It started in mid-January in USA from Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. And in mid-January, mid-December, sorry, in US and a month later, mid-January, we started our own indigenous vaccination programs. So Delta wave slowly spread across Europe, USA, and by end of 2020, this virus had been introduced in our country. At that time, we all were very happy, complacent that, oh, we've got over this virus very well. Rest of the world is struggling, but we've done very well. As you all will remember, there were a lot of political Bengal elections were on. There were a lot of political activities. Kumbh was on. Marriages were on because we were just coming out of the first wave. All that led to a massive community spread. The numbers were slowly surging, but we ignored it. And by March of 2021, we came to the infamous second wave. And I don't think any one of us is ever, ever going to forget those horrible, horrifying uh, images of people dying for want of oxygen the kind of crisis I don't think humanity has ever faced in the past. All these images will remain etched in our memory. I don't think we will ever be able to. I have not seen partition. Most of us have not seen partition, but I don't know if it was worse or whatever. But these are horrifying images which we all saw. I also faced the death of many friends, relatives. It was horrifying that people were there on phone in the night wives begging me, bhaiya, kahin se oxygen cylinder arrange kara do, kara do, and I was not able to do that. It was very depressing as a doctor, people literally calling and begging for beds, oxygen cylinders, 
some support to get admitted to ICU, but despite being associated with so many hospitals, not able to help people. Very, very depressing. But then I thought, what is the point of feeling depressed? Why not we do something to help people? And that is when this idea came that whatever little I know about, because by that time I was regularly coming on the TV, uh, uh, giving these talks. So I thought, let's start making videos. So first video that we made was about how to look after yourself on, in home isolation. And we just put the six M's, you know, the medicine, the monitoring, the meals, the mindset, the, the uh, uh, what kind of activities you do and when you move to the hospital. So we just put it, the medicines and movement to hospital. So six M's. So what should be the medicines, what should be the monitoring, what should be meals, what should be the mindset, what kind of movement you do, and when do you move to the hospital. So we put it as six mantras, six M's for home isolation and put it in the social space and the power of social media actually took it all over. And then when the oxygen crisis started, then I learned from my ICU colleagues that if you lie in a prone position, this was something which was used in ICUs for over a decade. When we have people with adult ARDS and they are having low oxygen, we the patients on ventilator, they are put in prone position. So therefore, I thought, why not we apply this? So after discussing with all the experts, I went live on Z News and showed it live and then made a video and released it. And I'm happy to share that the video had more than 25 crore views across uh, various channels on how to improve your oxygen by by doing this and also by breathing exercises how you can improve pulse oximeter how to use oxygen cylinder how to use and then towards the end of second wave in the uh, 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 in the metros this started spreading to rural areas and i realized that these videos which talk about the hand hygiene and sanitizer and all that may not be relevant for the villages because they don't have, they have a different milieu. So we made this video, Gramir Parivaro Me Badlao Ke Char Kadam, and we put it in a very simple language, how using gamcha and using tree outside their house, how they can do isolation. So this was done. And then when the vaccination came and there was this famous vaccine hesitancy, religious issues, all kinds of issues. Again, we put out this video on how to face vaccination. And fortunately, by grace of God, each of the videos was very well received. And then by November of 2001, this wave started receding. We came out of it. And just when we were enjoying coming out of the second wave, we were then hit by the third wave, the Omicron. Initially, when it came, there was horror because it was supposed to be more infectious than Delta. But by grace of God, it turned, although it was more infectious than Delta, it was escaping the vaccine more than the Delta used to do. But fortunately, it turned out to have lung likeness much less than Delta. And therefore, although many more people had third wave infection in terms of numbers of people affected, but there was much lower rate of admission, ICU admission, ventilators, and deaths. And we came out of this very third wave very quickly. Uh, two reasons. One, since it was a more self-limiting disease. And second major difference between second wave and third wave was in second wave, uh, the, the vaccination had just started and mostly health workers and frontline workers were vaccinated. The rest of the public wasn't. But by the time the third wave came, lot of people had some immunity either because of natural infection during the second wave, which a lot of people had, plus minus the vaccination. Because by the time third wave, more than 75% of the people had received at least one dose, which was giving them some protection. So protection from the vaccine, protection from the natural infection during the second wave, both these antibodies put together prevented the people from getting serious disease. So it's known that vaccination may not prevent you 100% from getting infected, but vaccination does protect you from getting serious infection. And that's how we came out of the third wave much quicker than we did with the first and second wave. So where are we today? 
is it the end of pandemic so pandemic is when you have huge number of cases across wide geographical areas in huge numbers and endemic is when you start keep having small small number of cases in in a wide geographical area so are we uh, moving now from pandemic to endemic are we likely to get another variant in the near future will it be milder will it be stronger well i think there are no clear cut answers to this going by the spanish flu which we had 100 years back there was the third wave also in the spanish flu after which it converted from pandemic to endemic and then it continues till date we have these uh, these these uh, flu viruses still present we have pneumonia viruses still present they still keep afflicting hundreds and thousands of people some of them dying also so i think in times to come this covid will also turn into an endemic it will be there all the previous viruses which have come whether it was sars virus mers virus uh, the uh, h1n1 all those continue to afflict people every now and then even these days we every now and then we have icu admissions because of h1n1 etc etc so i think something similar will happen with the covid also that it will continue it will become endemic and we will learn to live with it and continue with our life more important is uh, two days back uh, bill gates uh, gave a statement where he said that this is not the last of the pandemics and very soon humanity will be hit by another bug again a virus which may be even more severe than the covid virus and when we start wondering why are people making these presumptions if you look at the trajectory of the last two decades most of these pandemics have been viral infections so when there is a bacterial infections we have effective antibiotics we can use it and kill the bacteria fungus is not that highly infectious to spread in a in a in a global manner and cause a pandemic but virus is the one which has a highly infectious replicating nature and can <laughs> spread from one person to another and take the form of a pandemic so in the last 20 years all the pandemics which have occurred whether it was zika mers sars h1n1 and covid all these have been virus and if you look at it most of these were initially not human viruses these were mostly animal viruses which jumped a species and came to afflict the human being and when you start analyzing the cause for that you find a very clear cut link with air pollution and climate change what air pollution and climate change is doing is leading to mass scale migration of animals in different parts of the world they are leaving their habitats and moving to different habitats to face the onslaught of climate change and that is bringing them and the human beings face to face and thereby giving an opportunity for these animal viruses to jump species and come to the human being so what i would say is that certainly this pandemic is not the last of the pandemics which human race has faced there will be more pandemics coming in the future and therefore it behoves all of us and the governments across all the countries in the world to prepare our health system so on one hand we need to face and fix these problems of air pollution climate change if we don't fix that our future is doomed on the other hand the health infrastructure needs to be upgraded to be able to face these challenges in the future so what are we recommending today now that the third wave is on the decline well even if the viral third phase is on the decline the possibility of this virus mutating any day and hitting us back again always exists and out of all the measures that we took since we don't have any potent anti viral medicine the prevention remains the best option and in prevention out of mask social distancing etc etc mask has been proved to be the most effective method particularly if it's n95 mask it has been shown 
that in numerous studies from across the world, it has been shown that if people are wearing masks and particularly the infected person and the other person, if both are wearing N95 mask fitting properly, then the chances of transmission are greatly reduced. In addition, if you have social distancing also maintained, if you have avoidance of mass gathering in closed spaces, again, studies from across the world, from various birthday parties, marriage parties, hotel parties, they, and open air parties, the analysis of the patterns of infection has shown that when you have people, large number of people in closed spaces, that is when the, and you have air conditioning, the same air being circulated, one person coughs and releases the aerosol, it remains in the air, it keeps circulating, and all those in the, that closed room, they inhale, that's when the chances of infection are the highest. When the first wave started, all of us were almost crazy about hand washing. You remember we used to say vegetables should be kept at the door, newspapers should not be touched, any carton should be left in dust open for four hours and sanitize it and wash your hands. Now we have realized, but that was the perception at that time. At that time, not much attention was being paid to aerosol, but later on, within a few months, we realized that hand-based transmission was occurring, but it's a much lower method of transmission. Direct aerosol transmission is the major mode of transmission where a well-fitting mask plays a huge role in reducing the possibility of infection. The vaccine, of course, continues to be important. There have been a lot of questions about vaccine, whether a vaccine has helped or not. I will not go into analyzing each and every study because that will take seven hours. But what I'll do is that whatever studies are available, two, three points have emerged very clear. Number one, full vaccination is more potent than single dose. So whether it is Covaxin or Covishield or Pfizer or Moderna, <laughs> if you take just one dose, it gives you some protection, but if you take the second dose after the required period and wait for some time, that gives you the proper protection. That's number one. So full vaccination is important. Number two, there have been variations in the effectiveness. I don't think there is such huge difference that people should go crazy about that. Most of the vaccines are showing effectiveness. None of the vaccine is 100% effective. Despite all the claims of Pfizer and Moderna, if Pfizer and Moderna were as effective as they claimed, US, which had hundreds and thousands of vials lying on the shelves of the stores for people to put it, and people did put it also, it should not have seen the kind of second and third wave and the fourth wave that it saw. The very fact that it continued to spread there, even in those who had got vaccines, meant that it was not as 95, 96% effective as the companies had claimed it to be. Yes, all of them are effective. The effectiveness in preventing the infection is not that great. So they do provide 60, 70, 80% kind of infection. But more important is once you get infection, the chances of severe disease, respiratory involvement, ICU admission, ventilatory requirement, and death, these are reduced to a great, great extent by effective vaccine uh, antibody availability. Whether that antibody has come because of your previous natural infection or that antibody has come following vaccination, both are equally effective. In fact, most of the people say that natural infection gives you far stronger antibodies than the vaccine gave. And if you have had a natural infection and after a certain amount of time, you've got the vaccine also, which acts as a booster because you've already got the infection earlier, the two together gives you much higher levels of protection. So suffices to say, that vaccination as of today is one of the most potent methods of not only preventing the spread of COVID, but more importantly, preventing death from COVID. So therefore, of course, we've reached one of the highest levels of general 
community penetration of uh, uh, vaccination thanks to the massive and very very creditable vaccine program of the government uh, this should continue to reach 100 percent levels uh, there have been numerous studies about the method of transmission of these viruses but one thing is clear that aerosol transmission is the main method of transmission and this virus remains in the air for quite some time and therefore adequate ventilation of the room not too many people accumulating in one room is important another area which has got highlighted is that people keep wearing and of course mask is very important one area where actually mask fails for a short time and i want to mention this specifically is in the offices suppose there are five of us in the office all of us are sitting in our cabins we are all wearing masks during lunch time we all get together and sit on a table and for eating we remove the mask now that becomes a big uh, virus spreader even for 10 minutes if you sit next to each other and have food together talking together without mask that is enough to transmit the disease so therefore this uh, mask of course needs to be removed but isolation needs to be continued during lunch time also this study showed that this was a practice which was often leading to problems post covid uh, issues have been raised fortunately majority of the people recover a few go to icus etc etc there is something called post covid syndrome post covid issues long covid prolonged covid severe covid all kinds of terms are used this is basically symptoms persisting more than six weeks beyond an acute episode in the form of some problems or the other and when you look at them you can broadly divide them into two categories there are physical issues and there are mental emotional and psychological issues when you come to physical issues physical issues could be related to lungs could be related to heart could be because of clotting could be related to abdomen uh, mentation system there are different different systems so covid virus affects everything from head to toe different people have involvement of different areas commonest of course and especially in the second wave was the involvement of the lungs but there are people who had involvement of the heart so tachycardia persistent high rate high heart rate 120 130 has been a very common problem in these people heart blockades have occurred heart irregularities have occurred some people have even complained of bradycardia with heart rate going 45 40 35 per minute so these kind of physical issues if they are there they need to be seen by a specialist and they need to be fixed similarly breathlessness persistent cough persistent chest pain uh, uh, a fall in saturation on slightest of exercise these are all evidences of lung involvement uh, which have continued to be there a 5 to 10% of the people with severe lung involvement have gone on to develop cavities some of them have got infected by fungus which could be aspergillus or mucor the black fungus aspergillus or mucor these are the two common funguses that we have seen in these people and once they develop they need antifungal followed by resection of that segment of cavity so cardiac issues are there lung issues are there many people are complaining of what is called brain fogging they become forgetful they become very irritable there are mood changes there are behavioral changes then there are abdominal issues being reported some people are persistently having uh, abdominal pain diarrhea a very common problem is lethargy asthenia people say doctor bas utha hi nahi jata lagta hai sharir mein jaan hi nahi hai sare muscles khatam ho gaye hain so severe muscle weakness is another area persistent joint pains is another problem so from cardiac involvement to lung involvement to musculoskeletal involvement brain involvement abdominal tissue involvement these are all various physical issues which people are having and once you see them they need to be seen by a specialist and a specialized care has to be given but 
other than them more important is what i have seen mental emotional and psychological issues where you do work up you do all the ecg eco is normal you do lung function test hrct it's more or less okay you do lft kft everything is normal but the person is not feeling well so they have a lot of feeling of unwell this is what i call mental emotional psychological issues and these are because of various reasons which are present now this is i have mentioned and these are because these people have been diseased for long many of them have been in the hospital they have been in the icus a lot of people have a huge financial issue somebody had to sell his property somebody had to do this hundreds and thousands of people have left, lost their jobs there is uncertainty about future and there is a plethora of information slash misinformation coming on the whatsapp university now all these things put together have put a lot of stress on the minds of people and that stress is manifesting in the form of their having psychological issues so how do i address them i put out a video uh, which was the last of my videos on this issue how to face uh, post covid issues and the first thing i i i it was a 17 minute video in which i said the first thing that you need to do is to restructure your 24 hours because when you are in the hospital when you are in the icu the 24 hour schedule goes hey wire it's all day 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 because tube lights are on monitors are on everybody is moving all the time you lose that track of day and night the biological clock goes for a toss what you need to do is to restructure your biological clock get proper sleep make fix fix a time that okay 10 o'clock uh, by 8 o'clock i'll have my dinner i'll have a little post in a stroll some music and by 10 o'clock i'll switch off the lights and go to sleep and try and have that 10 to 6 kind of a sleep cycle get up in the morning after your morning chores do a little bit of light exercise i don't advise anybody to go for a 42 km cycle walk from day 1 which few people did and paid a price but a little bit of exercise more importantly start doing some relaxation meditation there are a lot of material available on the internet anyone can be chosen but do some relaxation exercise and thereafter if you have lost your job if you are at home or you are working from home so you're not having an opportunity to go i advise people to do what is called positive addiction or meaningful engagement now today there is a total unlock all offices are open people have started going but go back couple of months 10 12 months say around june july of 2021 when we were just coming out of the second wave people were still at home and this is what i found at that time that instead of crying and being depressed all the time if you choose an activity which gives you pleasure and gives others also pleasure slash information this is a very good way of engaging yourself and it helps tremendously in coming out of this mental issues and my going addicted into that making all 13 14 videos was part of what i called positive addiction i was also very stressed at that time uh, i also lost relatives at that time but i converted that depression or that anxiety into a meaningful engagement each of the videos took about 2 to 3 days to prepare so that consumed my time that gave me pleasure that okay i am able to help out people and that was a great solace and great source of strength so physical activity is important if you keep lying in the bed all the time you make your body weaker you decrease your immunity but some amount of physical activity is important and there is enough uh, uh, literature now available so i say that of course today it's not important because today we are opened up and we are going out but at that time when we were saying that have physical distancing stay connected with people another thing i recommend to these people who are having post covid psychological issues is to share their problems with others you know when you it's a beautiful saying that problem shared is problem half 
but if you share with people whatever fears whatever uh, anxiety if you share with people people will come up with solutions they'll help you and that will help you come out of it so post covid psychological stress or psychological issues is primarily a body's psychological response to the stress which you have had and the solution out of that is also by taking help of people and converting that negative stress into a positive situation what i have found to be great great help is the next five points number 1 positive thinking number 2 positive thinking number 3 positive thinking number 4 positive thinking and number 5 positive thinking now there is tons and tons of research data which is available from very well conducted international scientific studies which proves that people who have positive thinking attitude have lower incidence of diseases and higher longevity than those who are negative thinkers and the same holds true for recovery from covid also that positive thinkers behave much better and have a much stronger better outcome than those who have negative thinking because the way you think is the way you feel and the way you feel is the way you act and when you act in a positive manner positive things happen and if you act all the time in a negative manner wolf 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 you keep doing the wolf definitely come because the situation is not in your control we need to tell i told myself i said look this is not in my control i may be a senior doctor i may be a connected doctor connected to aims gangaram medanta but okay fine beds are full if beds are full they are full what can i do there is no point in my getting stressed getting depressed at the fact that i can't get beds to my my whatever little i can do i can give them video i can help them by whatsapp i can help them by talking so instead of cribbing about what i cannot do if i do what i can do this is a much better way of responding to the situation than crying all the time about what you cannot do what i found was uh, this uh, that when you have positive thinking you heal yourself you heal your family and the family is put together make society and the society is put together make the country so if you become a source of healing and you spread this uh, flame of healing all around you by your positive thinking be highly highly infectious in terms of positive thinking more infectious than omicron also then this 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 wave of positivity spreads and it brings healing to the society this is my last slide and i always show this slide that a helping hand that you extend to others will be the biggest helping hand that you would have ever received we are not doing a favor to the other person by offering him a helping hand he is doing a favor to you by accepting your helping hand because it is you who will heal yourself by offering a helping hand to others uh ladies and gentlemen i'll stop here and here after i'll be happy to take questions directly then there are a couple of other issues which also i want to share but i think we'll have face to face connect have some questions and then go specifically over any issues that you may like to raise thank you so much sir uh, now i request uh, dr mukhinder sir and dr arun bhai sir to take over for the further discussion and whoever has question kindly raise your hand so that we can unmute you and you can then ask your queries dr mukhinder sir dr wahi sir kindly take over <clears throat> many thanks uh, we have had really a wonderful session so far by dr arun kumar the most important part as i would put it is the what he has mentioned in the later part positive thinking positive thinking positive thinking and so on. i think that was something uh, i would like to share my own uh, learning or and experience is which i learned in 1980 at the orange institute of physical medicine and rehabilitation 
is that recovery is always fast. When you start coming to the, your normal activities, so as early as possible. This happens in all cases, whether it's any disease condition or even a mental shock like the, the tragedies or the deaths of the nears and years. And this is one thing uh, which we have been conducting in our own practice, coming directly to COVID-19 specifically. Uh, interestingly enough, if we compare it with the uh, first pandemic, which was in 1920, and then the second pandemic now, if we think of, of, uh, about the world population, this time, uh, population in the world has been much more. And especially if we compare with India, then I would still say, whatever reasons and whatever approach might have been, fatalities in India perhaps have been not on that wide scale as they have been in other so many uh, developed countries, in spite of a uh, lot of stress on the resources. So that is one thing I would like to have Dr. Arun Kumar's observation about that part. And, uh, positive thinking part again, I will take you because uh, in our own practice, we always we, uh, told the patients, just please do not go by the fear of the negativity or whatever you feel about the COVID-19 name. It is no doubt it is a comparatively severe form of influenza as we, we have been seen and practicing, but don't have the pressure of the COVID-19 on your mind. And we have seen that even in the second variant, the Delta variant was quite severe, yet uh, we had at least I can say about in our own practices, we had lesser complications and lesser fatalities. Of course, uh, all of us, I think there is hardly anybody uh, who has not lost his near and dear and so on and so forth. Yet, even during those critical times, the approach that please do not have any fear because of the COVID-19 nomenclature. This is a severe form of influenza, but then it will go. Based on that, again, I think all of us, you know, are receiving the almost daily the queries. Sir, kya Omicron ke baad mein ab to khatam ho gaya, nahi? And as Dr. Arvind Kumar has mentioned, well, nobody can predict, especially when he has quoted the uh, example of Bill Gates. What is going to happen? There's a separate issue altogether. But I think the positivity is important. And as a homeopath, I would uh, uh, suggest that the physical illnesses, so far as the concern, then you know, we have got all the medical infrastructure as mentioned by Dr. Arun Kumar. And so far as the uh, psychological aspects or the emotional aspects, I think homeopaths can serve the society much, much more better because we are oriented in that direction. This is what I would like to end. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I 100% agree and I again reiterate that positive thinking was probably one of the most important things uh, which I think was present in our country far more than in the West. Uh, you know, all of us who've traveled across uh, US and across uh, Europe would agree that the family support system is far, far stronger here then in those countries where people mostly live singly and, uh, you know, more support system is more in the form of cards or messages rather than people standing outside, where here we had families standing outside the hospital. For one individual, you will have 10 people standing outside. And I think that's a great, great support system that we have, which helps. No wonder that the incidence of psychological issues in our country uh, was much lower than in the West. People have been talking about suicides, about uh, marital issues during the COVID isolations. Uh, of course, not to say that these issues did not occur here. We did have suicides, we did have fights, all those problems. But I think the incidence was much lower in our country than in the West. And that's mainly to do with the kind of huge, uh, very, very well-developed a social support system that we have. 
In terms of uh, lower mortality, as Dr. Wahi said, well, there could be two issues. One is, sir, the reporting of the deaths. I can definitely vouch that in US and Europe, every death is reported. So whether it is, so in, you know, and there are two terms which were used, COVID death and COVID associated death. So I am aware of a large number of cases where say somebody had an MI heart attack and he died and he also had COVID. Now, whether you will cause it COVID death or you would cause it, call it a death due to heart attack, but COVID also present. So there were these issues which came up in our country at many places. And this, of course, can we can go on discussing this, but definitely I agree with your assessment that the overall mortality in our country was lower. And I think the worst time where we avoided mayhem was in the first wave because nobody knew what is COVID. We, I did not know the full meaning of PPE before the start of pandemic. Nobody had seen this PPE. We only used to see it in TV images. There was no way of symptoms, vaccines, treatment, nothing was known. And if we had faced a massive, massive number of cases across the country, the situation would have been much worse. By the time the second wave came, we were comparatively much better prepared. Despite that, we had the oxygen crisis. Imagine if this had happened in March of 2009, 2020, the outcome would have been much worse. Anyway, now all that is part of history. Fortunately, we are out of it. So I think let's talk positive, look forward to positive and better days ahead, sir. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Arun. We have uh, a question from Dr. Praveen Kumar. Dr. Praveen, you can unmute yourself, please. Yes, ma'am. I've unmuted. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Arun, uh, I just wanted to ask uh, how familiar, uh, of course, you would be familiar with the homeopathic uh, outfit, but how familiar are you with the way we in homeopathy treat the COVID patients? <laughs> well, uh, uh, I have no personal experience of that. So I, I'll, 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 because there are a large number of homeopathic doctors and uh, on behalf of these doctors and being a doctor myself, uh, in homeopathy, we treat, suppose we have 10 patients of COVID coming to us. So in homeopathy, we would not be giving them the same medicine. We would be treating them on the basis of the variance in their individual symptoms. They might be all 10 COVID positive, but when we give them medicine, it is on the basis of what specific modalities for example, some could one could be very restless, another could be uh, very uh, you know uh, feeling very weak and uh, not talking at all, averse to talking. So the medicines in both the patients would be different. And interestingly, as many of the homeopathic doctors would agree with me, that we have had many successful uh, treatments on the basis of these, you know, coinciding the individual symptoms of the patient with the homeopathic medicine. So I have two observations to make. Uh, first observation is that if it is, if the disease is, in, is entirely caused by the COVID, uh, varia, you know, COVID virus, then how is it that there are different, uh, you know, symptoms in different individuals? So what I'm trying to emphasize is the significance of the host environment, the host cells, as also to say the individual identity which is continuously and dynamically interacting with the, you know, with the virus. And this is nothing new because mutation is a normal process of the virus. And I would go to the extent having, you know, talked to many of the, you know, uh, virologists in many parts of the world, I would say that the virus is so dynamic that even when it goes to a, and interacts with an individual body, it comes out in a peculiar way and it could be so peculiar 
that we have a different variant as per the individual identity it is it is as uh, it is as it could be as specific as the genetic code one could go to that extent so uh, our understanding as more uh, passes can you please can you please just 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 just, just 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 one more minute yeah. Yeah. i am i am you know i am not asking a simple question i am i am you know questioning the basic theory of the covid as it is going around in the world as a homeopathic doctor so what i have to say of course would need a probably a much much larger time and uh, audience to be able to uh, appreciate what we are saying but what i am saying is that as virologists also they they understand that viruses even in their most lethal forms cannot do anything unless they have some peculiar interaction with the host cells in and which a vaccine is is a much is a much uh, say i would say unsuccessful way of handling it rather than as a homeopathic doctor who is individually treating the patient on the basis of his you know symptoms Dr. so i am questioning the sorry sorry go ahead please mm -hmm. of course it's a long discussion i i have about maybe uh, several points which i can talk okay and so uh, what for example i would say just just one more point for example we talk of two possibilities of the you know covid virus coming the first possibility we say that the, it happened in wuhan lab now you know the biological labs the virus labs are are there are there since long it was it was they started somewhere in this first world war and they are all over the world so the china chinese wuhan lab was not the only lab we have islamic nations who are so hardlining that they would they would they would love to make such viruses and float around the world and kill the entire populations and only let islam live uh, there dr. are some Praveen, such hardliners I, like that may so i request us you have to go uh, dr aruda i think we we should not go into political issues you know no uh, i'm not talking political no please dr aruda can you please take over dr. Uh, because dr. i would I'm request that political dr arvind Doctor, Doctor, we have to pause. 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 Doctor we also were taught that there are three things which determine a disease there is a host there is a causative agent and there is an environment everything relates to host causative agent and environment i will give example of smoking we all know that smoking can cause lung cancer now there are millions of people who smoke but not everybody who smokes gets lung cancer so obviously the same positive agent is causing more problem in me but not causing problem in you so that relates to the host so every disease is an interplay of host positive agent and environment it is the complex interplay of the three which determines the outcome whether you get the disease or not and whether you get severe disease and whether you survive or not i 100% agree with you Dr. Praveen Kumar, Dr. Vahi, over to you, sir, for the moderation. Uh, thanks, sir. I mean, uh, I am sorry to say that there has been a deviation from the main topic, and let me say on behalf of Dr. Praveen Kumar, I must apologize, and I would request all others who are to ask you a question, please be specific. Uh, we should not deviate because if you go from in that direction, you know, we have to go to the history of medicine where the Uh, there has been a lot of changes in the nature of the disease so that's it all together a different topic but yeah. what focus is on the on our current issue and who knows after viruses maybe there's something more deeper which will come in future so let us focus entirely on the prevalent and we should focus ourselves only on to, on the topic concern that's my request to everybody thank you sir and another doc thana just one minute sir uh, with your with the permission of dr wahi after we finish this discussion on uh, covid i would like to take 5 minutes and discuss with you one more very important issue and that is role of all of us uh, it's a great opportunity that i have to address my homeopathic colleagues 
there is a group called doctors for clean air covid may go but there is a bigger problem which each one of us facing our children are facing their future is at stake and i would like to use this opportunity when i have a uh, 65 of my homeopathy colleagues with me to share with you a beautiful concept called doctors for clean air so once i am done with questions i'll put those slides with the kind permission of dr wahi and dr arora dr khanna please go ahead sir and thank you for your patience sir you've been waiting for so long डॉक्टर संगीत सैगल शी हैड रेज क्वेश्चन डॉक्टर संगीत प्लीज गो हेड गुड मॉर्निंग सर मॉर्निंग फर्स्ट ऑफ फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल थैंक यू सो मच फॉर अ वेरी वेरी इंफॉर्मेटिव एंड वेरी वेरी इंफॉर्मेटिव सेशन वेरी गुड लर्निंग आई विश टू आस्क इफ अ पर्सन दैट्स इन्फेक्टेड विद कोविड बट हैज येट नॉट डेवलप्ड सिम्टम्स एंड बींग अन अवेयर ही टेक्स अ डोज ऑफ वैक्सीन what can be the consequences yeah so so when we know that somebody is having covid the recommendation had been to go for vaccination a month after the attack of covid but what you are saying is that somebody is having asymptomatic infection if he is not aware and he goes for vaccination i don't think any 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 kind of a serious problem will occur large number of people actually have taken this way and there are not many issues the reason being that the the virus which is going in vaccine is actually attenuated virus and therefore it can only induce immunity it does not have the possibility of aggravating the nature of your disease so however is- when you know it as a measure of abundant precaution one month gap had been advised by the government sir if the person is in incubation period yeah right. so so dr sangeet when you are in incubation period you are not aware when yeah. you have asymptomatic infection you are not aware so that is the time when the virus is already multiplying in your body if you give vaccine which is again either a part of the virus as is the case with other vaccines or attenuated virus as is the case with covid shield i don't think you are going to cause any additional problem thank you sir one more question what is your take on booster dose yeah so booster dose has been recommended has been used also i myself have taken it because it was permitted and there are enough studies which have shown that about 6 months after the previous infection or the previous dose of vaccine the antibody level start coming down and as that happens the level of protection decreases and at this time if you give an additional dose the levels rise again and the protection improves now this has been proved to be hugely so i have looked at studies from different parts of the world which have analyzed the benefit of booster dose in immunocompromised individuals now immunocompromised people on steroids people cancer patients and all these people do not develop antibodies to first and second dose as well as the normal people do so in these people the booster dose has a much higher benefit coefficient than in normal people but it has been shown to help everybody the caution is that many people have gone for fourth dose fifth dose you know israel was the first country to go for third dose and they even started going for fourth dose now if you do this overdosing that has been shown in some cases to be counterproductive but giving a booster dose about 6 months after the previous dose till now has not been shown to be of any harm anywhere many studies have shown benefit the maximum benefit coming in those who had lesser response to previous two doses thank you sir thank you so much so we have a query from uh, dr kavita sachdev she is asking how to overcome with post vaccination symptoms of body ache yeah so post vaccination body ache is reported in some individuals even i had uh, for about 10 days also not so much body ache but calf ache lot of pain in the calf what i have seen is that uh, adequate hydration good diet 
positive thinking and not coming to bed rest but avoiding excessive activity and having a positive outlook just giving it some time most of the symptoms will disappear the best part about the psychological and mental and such general issues in the post covid or post vaccination is that if you give it enough time most of these symptoms uh, settle with passage of time but if people have highly strong personality they keep jumping from one doctor to another keep getting host of investigations done they take much longer to recover than those who understand it well and then face it boldly thank you sir uh, dr anju bora you have a similar question uh, so i think sir has already answered that uh, there is one question from dr harshala any other vaccine required to take after vivid other than vaccine against covid no right now for covid situation only covid but otherwise elderly people people who have copd etc they have been taking those pneumovac vaccines so those are unrelated issues so anybody who was on a regular vaccination will continue with or without covid but for covid covid vaccine is the only thing recommended sir so i have one query yes you have seen in uh, like especially when our maids come or rural people uh, population that they do not have proper aadhar card also so sometimes there is a cross of vaccination in the first dose and the second dose because they are also not aware that which vaccine they had taken in the first shot so what are your inputs on that sir yes How so madam there are in vaccination you know normally a vaccine development is a 10 year process but in the case of covid that 10 year timeline was condensed to one year timeline and the vaccine came in the market one year from the start of work on it so naturally all the processes were fast forwarded and as the time is increasing we are learning every day every week every month and even today there are more questions unanswered than answered but what we clearly know is that it's working and it's working in prevention as well as in prevention of severe disease regarding the issue of mixing of vaccines there has been lot of data from europe and other countries which says that if you combine one type of vaccine and another type of vaccine the response of antibodies is higher than having both the vaccines of the same time but at the same time there is data to the contrary also so the net result has been that our national advisory group on vaccination which advises the government of india about these issues till now has stayed clear of the controversy and has recommended the same vaccine so if you go by the government of india guidelines if you've taken covi shield they recommend covi shield and vice versa but there are people who privately have done mixing of vaccines based on data coming from various trials see this is scientific development now there is one trial from from brazil which has reported something but there is a trial to the contrary from somewhere else so unless a concrete uncontrovertible unquestionable data comes out government recommendations usually are based on a standard data and not on experimental data okay okay so we have a query from dr shelja sharma uh, sir the recommendation for booster dose is 9 months or as you mentioned just now that the antibodies fails after 6 months yeah so can i opt for it after 6 months of no actually dose? the government see that again i come back to the same question so lot of reports from west have used 6 months as the at top point and they have been giving after 6 months when our advisory group actually analyzed the data they put this 9 months period because they found that there was see when you give a government recommendation for application in a country of uh, 140 crore people you have to take a lot of logistics issues also into consideration for example when the children's vaccination was opened 
people knew that it is helping in the 12 to 15 age group also and there were trials already available but they opened initially to 15 to 18 and not 12 to 18 because there was a logistics issues that if 20 crore children were to you know crowd around the vaccination centers that itself may become a logistics issue so they staggered it to 15 up to 18 and now 12 to 15 will open and then 9 to 12 will open. So many times while taking decisions, you take logistics also into consideration. Availability of vaccine is also an issue. And therefore, this nine-month period was fixed by government of India. But there are governments in the West who are giving it after six months. Sir, so she has similar question uh, on the second side of it. That if a child gets positive, should we go for CRP, CBC? while treating it symptomatically? No, there is no need. I had been very, very clear, categorically recommending against, you know, in the second wave, every day I was on the TV advising people not to go to CT scan centers for every problem and use breath holding time as an index of your lung function test and only go if you have a decline in the breath holding time. Similarly, if you have an uncomplicated fever for three to five days, your fever is not very high, it's getting control with the crocin. Uh, you are not having any excessive cough, there are no other symptoms. By third to fifth day, your fever starts coming down, you start recovering, your appetite improves, there is no need to go for unnecessary tests. It's only when your fever goes beyond seven days, you have excessive cough, you have chest pain, you have fallen saturation, breathless, respiratory rate going above 22. Those are the situations where you need to go for hospitalization and further investigation. A run of the mill, uncomplicated case just needs paracetamol, good diet, good hydration, and avoidance of smoking and alcohol. Uh, Dr. Nonita yes. Aurora is asking, what about vaccination in children? So children vaccination 15 to 18 age group is already open. I think more than 70% of the children are already vaccinated and it's expected that very soon they'll prepone it to 12 to 15 and then it will probably go to 9 to 12. So in a phased manner, they are going to open more and more age groups. And sir, uh, through this platform, what will you guide to the parents? Because now children have to increase their physical activity so they cannot put mask on during physical activity as no. oxygen demands goes yes. high. Yes, I always say that any physical activity should be without a mask, never do activity with the mask. So therefore, now that schools are opening, I would still say that, uh, you know, when you are in the classroom, please request the children to keep the mask on. When you are traveling in the bus, please keep the mask on. And only when you go out, go out to play in small groups so that when you remove the mask, at least too much of crowding is not there. So as much as physically possible, keep the windows of the classrooms open, keep the rooms well ventilated and maintain some distance between the two. Mask is the single most important factor, Dr. Arora. Thank you. Can I now share my slides on Doctors for Clean Air, which will take five yes. minutes, and then we'll start the thing. Do I have your permission, Dr. Vahi? Dr. Vahi, sir? Sure, sure. Because Vini, uh, I was actually early, earlier going to say, you have mentioned a very important point in your last slide, that biggest problem is the air pollution. Now, even, even though, you know, I mean, earlier we used to blame a lot of rally burning. But that is not so because even now, I think automobile any is one of the biggest contributors to that. So that is an area which is uh, more important to tackle now, as you have mentioned, that uh, need for the clean air, doctors for clean air. I think I would request you to please. So, so once again, thank you very please. much. And once again, greetings. Uh, so uh, as, as a chest surgeon, you know, I have been looking at lungs since 1988. And very sad to report that in my 30 years career as a, as a chest surgeon, I have seen a change in the color of lungs of people from the pink lungs that I used to see in people earlier and black lungs only in smokers. These days, it's a rarity for me to see a pink lung in anybody. And pained by this fact, about seven years back, along with three of my colleagues uh, in the department, 
I set up an NGO called Lung Care Foundation with the purpose of making people aware, making people, uh, you know, uh, aroused as to the dangers of air pollution and requesting them for some action. So awareness, clinical care, research was the purpose of this Lung Care Foundation. And I always say, people consider air pollution as an environmental problem, that this is to do with chemicals. Friends, it is not an environmental, it is purely a health problem. In fact, the levels that it has reached today, it is actually a national emergency. And we as doctors need to play a major role. Now, I had done an experiment in 2017 where we had 5,000 children from 35 schools of Delhi assemble in a hall, in a, in a, in a stadium and make the uh, uh, image of uh, uh, lungs. Uh, this was called the largest human image of an organ. Sorry, I've not got that slide here, but uh, this, is the, uh, this was actually a Guinness world record that we created. And that had international media attention and brought this to the notice. And I was invited to WHO headquarters for a talk. When I gave the talk there and I showed this slide of a normal, which I have taken in my operation theater, of a normal pink lung on your left hand side and a black deposit filled lung of a non-smoker from Delhi on the right hand side. This picture from WHO headquarters, it went viral. And then I was invited to United Nations headquarters also for the same talk which I delivered the next year. And then I wondered that out of so many great scientists who have been talking there about this, why did my talk have so much of effect on them? And when I talked to people, I realized that they used to talk of chemicals, levels, graphs, and charts Whereas I was talking of this picture of the lung and I was talking of this picture experiment, which I did in which we made this picture of lung. This is made of EPA filter, the same material which is used in the air conditioners. And we made it into the shape of lung and windpipe. And I put two exhaust fans behind each of these. So air was passing through it and within six days, you see this white lung became absolutely black. And then I showed to people that if this is what is happening to the lung outside, the same process is happening in our lungs inside also. And I also talked to them about a patient, this 34 year old lady had come to my OPD with some glands in the neck and on biopsy, it turned out to be a metastatic lung cancer. Non-smoker, non-smoking family, 34 years, she's developing lung cancer. So people said that these cases which you showed, it shook us, whereas people used to show graphs and charts, it never used to appeal to us. So then I realized that doctors are the most important people in the fight for against air pollution for two reasons. One is we see the effect of air pollution in our day-to-day -day practice. And therefore, why am I motivated? Because I have seen the black lungs in the operation theater. All of you would be seeing young children coming with asthmatic symptoms. It's increasing now, 30, 40% children these days are asthmatic. That's because of the bad air. So we are seeing the impact of air pollution. That's number one. So we are more motivated. And secondly, when we talk to the people, they listen to us because when health issue is to be talked about, it is going to touch people more than if you present it as a chemical issue. So based on this, I thought, why not form a group of doctors who can talk about this? And therefore, uh, about three years back, we set up this group called Doctors for Clean Air which was just a network of passionate, informed doctors, no specialty, anyone who is a doctor who feels about the issue of air pollution, who feels that his children 
his grandchildren need to get better air than what we have today he should become a member there is no joining fees there is no specific agenda all we do is to give them some information some material some questions and ask them to become a clean air champion in their area aware people i have realized that even so called educated people do not have much knowledge that air pollution is not a chemical issue it is actually eating our lung uh, lungs it is eating the future of our children so awareness raising amongst public awakening the public for faster actions and commitments from citizens and from politicians to reach out to pollution control boards and various other measures to increase the awareness that air pollution is a major problem side by side one more thing we did we realized that asthma is becoming a major problem in the school we came to know that couple of children died in schools because they had a severe asthma attack the teachers were waiting for the parents to come and the child went into severe attack and died so we made this asthma manual for schools where we laid down some guidelines how the teacher should respond if a child gets an emergency initially we made it in english but the environment minister said why don't you make it in all indian languages so we converted into 12 indian languages and it is available at our website lcf.org for free download anybody who wants to use it so i would appeal to all of you my uh, my colleagues and friends that i would share the link with uh, dr wahi and dr arora and any one of you who feels that yes as a doctor you need to do something about this issue to improve the air that our children our grandchildren will breathe you are more than welcome to join and contribute your might to the doctors for clean air thank you very much over to you dr wahi so so nice of you and i feel uh, that apart from the your earlier presentation which of course was very much relevant to the current uh, state of affairs it is much more important that you have taken up this project of doctors for clean air and bringing on the awareness i think you know i would request all of us at least those who are present here that they should join let us be champions in that regard So nice of you, Doctor. Doctor Wahid, sir. Uh, may I? Please. Ah, may sure. I, yes, Doctor Mukherjee, sir. Please come. Yeah, Doctor Arvind, it was a delight uh, to hear the insight you have developed as a motivator. So I would just mention few of the points which you have touched in your talk, and would de definitely that has an impact on me also. You talked about. the circadian rhythms biological clocks you talked about the 24 hour sh schedule you talked about the public concerns a doctor should have you talked about the motivator role of a doctor the influencer role of a doctor and these are the things which actually we forget in the rat race of earning more and more money our conscience has to be so pure and so motivated that when we are on the seat whatever we talk to the patient or on a public platform or in the forums that goes much deeper than anyone who is not a practicing uh, physician so i can see through the pure soul and a motivated conscience and a diligent person behind the stage and the stage where you are working at the level where you are working at you have contacts in the ministry you have contacts at the international level so a person of such a stature talking about these basic human and basic qualities of being a doctor basic qualities of being a human being i am really impressed and i would really love because i don't know how much you know about the homeopathy but i would definitely love dry like to draw your attention on this issue that dr heneman himself was a allopathic physician to start with he was a post graduate and later on when he understood and realized that 
during that practices where the children coming to us with an emergency we are handling it either with antibiotics or steroids but his basic disease remains the same even if the emergency is over i don't know how much you concentrate on these things that after the patient is out of icu or once the patient is out of crisis still he has numerous issues in the day to day life despite sure. taking all those uh, medicines being prescribed he has so many issues you have talked about the mental stress you have talked about the mental state and i would uh, definitely draw your attention that this is what the homeopathy is and unfortunately we homeopaths won't get so much of stages so much large stages to present ourselves but dr haneman was such a vocal and such an intelligent person that he actually addressed all these issues so to in nutshell to cut short my talk i will definitely invite you to take out some of the time from your busy schedule and read our book organ and of medicine if you need any thing i would definitely invite you and i'll definitely call upon you to read some of the homeopathic literature and the person like you the person of your caliber if is convinced with the homeopathy and that will definitely boost and your knowledge about human beings and the impact on that on the society thank you and i congratulate you for being a such a good human being thank you very kind of you sir for these golden words uh, i mean those are precious gems coming to me early in the morning i'm sure i'll have a wonderful day and i'll definitely pay attention to your advice and definitely come back to you after some time to inform you about the benefits i am received i promise that sir thank you so much dr arvind sir that you are so open minded of accepting all these different different views from different the medical practices so we also welcome you open heartedly for the same we have one more minute and uh, we will take a query from dr ashok madan he is waiting since long dr yes. ashok madan can you please unmute yourself thank you dr arora and uh, good morning to all doctors and special compliments and congratulations to dr arvind kumar dr madan uh, you are uh, in india or you are outside india now no i'm here in switzerland yeah. i'm from switzerland okay okay and what is the time over there right now 5 and 1/2 i started at 3:30 in the morning but now it is 5 o'clock and i was very very great spirit sir great spirit <laughs> So good morning to you uh, good morning to you dr kumar i have three qu uh, one question but including a b c uh, yes, first question was uh, also partially indicated to my uh, colleagues uh, for the doctors with homeopathy but anyway the main question related that great weakness certainly some doctor also asked for the pains post covid and second thing the psychological stress which was produced by this covid or isolations whatever lockdown fear was produced in the public and the patient itself which were recovered for that this fear that what will happen the fear of taking the disease they are washing the hands they are terrible they are advising others is maniac situations what to do with that and third question part is that still the people are not vaccinated and they don't like it to be vaccinated by here we have moderna and we have about 90% correct uh, informations that nothing happened serious after Uh, vaccination but uh, more or less about 80% people in switzerland they had the vaccination now from 16th is already almost opened uh, the relaxed restrictions but my question is that what will happen to these people who were not vaccinated what could really or what will happen to them please a yeah. little like Thank yeah. you very thank much. Thank you. Thank you very much sir. And I would go in the reverse way. So last question first. Yes uh, uh in India we've been fortunate that this vaccine hesitancy 
which was there very much in the beginning. A lot of people, political, various other issues. But fortunately, as the third wave came, uh, you know, the fear of getting infection in the third wave motivated a large number of people to go. And we have amongst the highest vaccination rates in the world today. And it's also continuing even now. We also play our role. Anyone who comes and he says he's not vaccinated, we motivate them. So, but the fact is that no one is safe unless everyone is safe. So till the day that every human being on earth is vaccinated, this virus has the potential to mutate and come back to us. So if it's the only thing that is needed for mutation is replication. So anywhere on the globe, if this virus is replicating and undergoes a mutation, it will not take more than 24 hours for it to spread across the globe, particularly now when the world is opening up again. So, sir, this fear remains. And that's why I said that the mask should continue to be our most potent weapon for many, many months to come. And I 100% disagree with the policies of the UK government and other governments who have said that there is no need for mask. As a doctor, I would continue to recommend that till such time that many months have passed and the virus numbers across the globe are on the decline, I think safety is an important concern and masks should continue to be used. That's my take. Number two, regarding psychological issues, I did mention in my slides that these are there because of various reasons. And what I have found, sharing the information, sharing your problems with other people and engaging yourself in a positive activity is one of the best ways to come out of the psychological crisis. I hope I have answered both your questions, sir. Dr. Kumar, thank you very much, really. And uh, the last thing that you told about these governments, especially in England, they have removed this and relaxed these restrictions. Certainly, I'm not agreed. I'm not agreed for block off and this fear of people, but to relax at once this to everybody, the people who are misusing these relaxed restrictions, they might not uh, spread again the situation, sure, sure. bad situation. So thank you for this comment. Sir, just so, to just to mention you, last year, Centers for Disease Control in yes. US, CDC Atlanta, did the same thing around mid of 2021. They removed mask uh, restrictions and there was a massive increase in the numbers across US. And within six weeks, they had to take back their recommendations. So I think sometimes these issues are done on political uh, yes. grounds, yes, sir. which may yes. not stand the scientific scrutiny. Thank you, sir. Thank you to you. Thank you very much, really. Namaskar. Namaskar. Dr. Arvind, so nice of you. I think we have uh, overspread, you know, of, of your valuable time. Nevertheless, it has been a very, very enlightening session. And we are, we are eagerly waiting for further sessions with you. Thank you, sir. It's been a real pleasure for me also. And uh, I take the recommendations from, from uh, Professor Sir very seriously. I would definitely uh, get the material, read it. Dr. Muktender, I'm going to read the material and come back to you and inform you of the benefits I have received. And maybe we'll have a discussion on that in some future session. In the meantime, I would share the link for joining uh, the Doctors for Clean Air. I would very humbly request each one of you to become a member. We would like this uh, flame to spread across the country. I would share the details with uh, Dr. Arora and Dr. Vahi. Yes, sir, and sure. you can circulate it amongst your There's no joining fees. Just go to the website, dfca.org. Just fill in your details. All you have to say that, yes, I'm committed to work for clean air. And we are doing this for our children and grandchildren because I think we owe it to them. With that, I once again thank all of you. And all of you have a wonderful day, sir. 
and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Arvind sir. And on behalf of IHF, I would really like to have more sessions with you. And we will invite you, re-invite you many times again, because uh, always I feel that uh, sharing information, sharing knowledge is always better than to have a half of knowledge. So I believe that you are also open to that and we will be learning from each other. Sure, as, as Dr. Mukhtendar says, has requested you to uh, go through the organ on of medicine, we are sure that we can connect on a better way and better platforms right. and we can work mutually for a cleaner air for our coming generations. So thank you thank so you. much, sir, for your time. And I also thank uh, Medanta, the Medicity, where you are working, you are putting in your efforts. To all the doctor students who have joined early morning with us in this session, I also thank team IHF for their untiring efforts they are doing day and night to make the sessions fruitful. I humbly thank uh, Edwin Biotech Private Limited, who are the supporting partners for this session and who have always extended their support to International Homeopathic Foundation. Thank you once again. And anybody who wants to be a member of International Homeopathic Foundation, kindly contact uh, our Joint Secretary, Dr. Gurbir Kaur, on the number displayed on the screen. And we will connect with you again on 25th of March, 2022, morning 8 a.m. with our eminent speaker, our own chairman of the academic sessions and the scientific committee, Dr. Mukhtinder Singh, sir. So we will uh, join again with you on 25th of March, 2022. Once again, I thank Dr. Arvind Kumar for his presence, for sharing the knowledge. Bye. Thank you so much, sir. Can I end the session now with your permission, sir? Sure. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Great thank day you for joining. You can end the meeting. Thank you, sir. I've done that, sir.